God, we praise you. We honor you. We bless you. We thank you. You are an everlasting God. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? If you know this song, you can lift it up with us.
son, please, I will wait. I will wait. That's it. He loves your worship. Lift your voice right where you are. I will wait. Well, praise God, I'm Bishop Joseph R. Welcome to Third Mount Zion Church right here, Nashville, Tennessee. Thank God for you today. Listen, I'm so excited to have you connected today, and this is our Bible study time, and we're so excited because God is so amazing. And I want to tell you something. You're not tuned in by accident today. You're tuned in because God wants to do something extraordinary in your life. We've been growing together, and uh, <laughs> I just cannot, cannot emphasize to you enough the power of God's Word. Today I'm going to be in this series today and uh, I'm going to be sharing how to move from being a victim to a victor. And uh, you know, a lot of us have been hurt, but we don't have to be hindered by it. So that's why I want you to stay tuned. Listen, I want you to follow me on social media, Joseph Walker 3. Follow my wife, Dr. Steph Walker. We love to be connected to you. We value relationships so much here in Mount Zion. and It's our way of staying connected. We want to do that. And also I encourage you to Make sure you get our podcast. It's free. It's called Next Level Leader. Hope you're being blessed by it. God is doing great things through it. And uh, it's free. Wherever you get podcasts, make sure you, you download it. Make sure you subscribe. I appreciate that. And then also, our new book. I'm so excited about this. Man, so many of you have been so kind. Thank you so much. Leadership and Loneliness is changing the world. And I encourage you to get your copy of your pastor's book. I want to keep putting content out there to give you something to continue to grow with. We're going to get ready to give as we get ready for this opportunity to grow in God's Word. And I want us today as we give our tithe and give our offering, that's so liberally. It's an opportunity for us to say to God, Lord, we appreciate how good you've been to us. And every time we give, we believe it's an act of the God of God's heart. So you can text the give right now. Text the keywords on the screen right now. Make sure you do that. Also, if you want to mail in your gift, do that right now. Mount Zion Church. Finance department, there it is on the screen. And make sure you send that in. We appreciate you so much. Let's pray, Father. Thank you for this opportunity we have to give today. We pray your blessings be upon each person, each household. And as we prepare to grow in your word today, let us grow together and be all you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Part two today, we're going to go a little deeper. Man, we got some stuff out of us last week, right? Offense. Woof. So many of you reached out. I appreciate you. Heard so many positive testimonies about letting things go. Today, we want to shift our mindset from being a victim to being a victor, having victory. In 1 Corinthians 15 and 57, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And this world, man, is full of people captivated by a victim mentality. And it's resulted in millions of people being enslaved and unable to realize their God-given potential. They're just kind of like in this place where they can't let it go. And the lens we use to look at the world and ourselves is actually how the world reacts back to us. Because what we look for in life is what we find. <laughs> Let me say that again. What we look for in life is what we find. Ask yourself this. When you finish complaining, you finish moaning about life, do you feel empowered or do you feel disempowered? God has given us this choice to either take responsibility or to take blame. 
I love this quote. If you can look up, you can get up. Because you don't mope around with the woe is me complex. Doesn't do you any good. Doesn't do anybody else any good. I've seen people all their lives just complaining, and walking around because they enjoy being a victim. See, when you start feeling bad for yourself for making excuses why you don't achieve specific goals, you begin to adopt this victim mentality instead of a victor mentality. Think about what I'm saying to you today. It's a mindset. It's a mindset. So what's the difference? I'm so glad you asked. So if one has a victim mentality, they recognize themselves as a victim of others' negative actions, and they tend to blame everyone else for their predicament. It's somebody else's fault. They did this to me. They did this to me. They did that to me, right? And those negative actions tend, tend to cause us to never come out of, that, out of that rabbit hole. We just keep going farther and farther in it. But when you adopt a victor mentality, your communication to yourself and others, you know, you, you begin to see yourself coming out to another level. You begin to see yourself laying all things I'm more than a conqueror. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You're, you begin to talk differently about life. You don't make excuses. You don't linger in what has occurred in your life. So it's essential to give ourselves time to tell our story Feel those feelings in the process, what happened in our lives, but you got to move on. Listen, you got to move on if you're going to be a victor. Now, I want to I talk about this for a second. At some point, you got to come to the crossroads. What will you do with all that energy? Will you put it towards something positive? Or will you continue to parade around telling the victim story? Let's be clear. Suffering is not a choice. It's not. Victim or victor, now that's a choice. That's an absolute choice. There are three types of victims. That's the martyr victim. A person who solely feels sorry for themselves. You know, in psychology, a person who has a martyr complex, you know, is a person who has the feeling of being a martyr for their own sake. They seek out suffering or persecution because it either feeds their desire to avoid responsibility. So some people just, you know, I feel like I'll be elevated if I'm a martyr. If I, if, if I constantly tell people that I'm, I'm being persecuted or people are against me, that that's a martyr complex. Then there's an arrogant, inferior victim. That's the person who cuts others down so they can feel better about themselves. You know people like that? Every time you see them, they're always chopping other people down. You know so-and-so, they're offering up stuff you never even asked about. You know so-and-so, they, they make me sick. I can't stand them. They think they're all this. It's not all that. Right? That's that inferior thing. And then there's the arrogant super victim. <coughs> person who thinks that they're more significant than the problem. Every person they face is below them. You know people like that, right? Everyone you know, else is a, is a fool who can't do anything right. We just can't get it right. I don't understand what's wrong with these people. That's still a victim complex. I, things would be better if I didn't have all these folk around me that were so incompetent. They were so stupid. They didn't do this. They didn't do that. That, that is an arrogant victim complex. And one of the things that I found out that we have this romanticized victimization. Let's look at that for a second. People just love to do that. Just, you know, gosh, man. I hate being on the phone with people like that because you get off the phone, you're like, Lord, I was having a great day until you called me and then you wore me out with all this. Why is it easier? Why do some people find it easier to play the victim rather than get on board with change? Here is the answer. Because playing the victim is a path of least resistance. You get attention for being the victim without having to do anything. And it doesn't hold the associated risk of failure if you try something new. <laughs> Sometimes victims will seek out fellow victims to support their view and reinforce their position and behaviors. You've seen this. All of them hang together. We all been done wrong. We all going up the rough side of the mountain. 
seeking out other people, looking for allies. That's why you got to be careful about the crowd you're in, man. People always walking around like they're going to be victims. And here's, here's the thing about groups of victims. They often dwindle as individuals decide to change. The moment you snap out of it and say, I'm done, those crowds begin to change. And those who remain will wonder if, if, if they are, you know, they'll wonder, okay, well then what's wrong with me? What's wrong with them? Right? This is important because I want you to process. You, m many people live the victim role, don't realize it, what they're doing, you know, and how it affects other people, how it impacts the lives of other people around them. This idea that I am a constant victim will wear you down. Now, now I want to help you shift the mindset. I want, I want to get you to this place, and I want you to, first of all, in doing that, you have to own your trauma and do not dump your drama. Let that sink in. Because when you own your trauma, you won't be tempted to dump your stuff on others. You make people in the future pay for things that happened in the past. How many times have you seen that? People paying for stuff that they never did. So what you got to do is name the trauma, come to grips with the entire story, and find someone to talk to. Find a therapist, walk through that, right? Get somebody to help you work through that stuff. You don't have to always expose it to the world, write a long post on social media. You don't have to do that to make yourself be more and more of a victim. Man, work that stuff out. That's why I wrote that book, Restored at the Root. This is the root work. You got to go deeper and deal with this stuff. Because listen, eventually you're going to have to snap out of it. You're going to have to snap out of it and resume your everyday life because you're going to have to continue to move on or this cycle will continue going on and on in your life. Now, there are seven signs of a victim mentality. This is how you know a person stuck in a victim mentality. Number one, they take no responsibility. They refuse to take responsibility for their circumstances they're in. And they refuse to acknowledge their role in anything. They just sit back, you know, instead, and they point the finger. Everybody's wrong but me. It couldn't be me. It was, it was my last seven boyfriends, but it wasn't me, <laughs> right? You refuse to take responsibility for your role, your action in the situation. You got to be honest with yourself. Reflect on the situation that you're playing victim in. And you got to write down things and take time to say, what role did I play in this perpetuation of the problem? What role did I play? Second, and this is a big one, living in the freezer. I call it living a frozen life. At this point, people are at the mercy of everyone and everything around them because those with the victim mentality will never make progress. They're just stuck in the same place. So when you try to ask them why they stagnant, you know, they have a laundry list of reasons why they're stuck. I, I, my life will be better. I will be further along if this hadn't happened. I would, I would, would have been here if that hadn't happened. They have no plan of escape. No, no, no true explanation as to their lack of progress. And they fail to understand that small changes in behaviors can reap big rewards. See, a large part of this is holding grudges, whether it be toward a person or a part of your life or circumstances in the present. You have got to get to a place where you understand if I'm going to shift my mindset, I can't be a victim holding on to grievances that make others feel bad about them. Just holding, I want to be a victim. Some people use victimization because they have a need to be needed. The more I play a victim, the more attention it draws to myself. <laughs> right? They like these words. What's wrong? You okay? Because it shifts everybody's attention to them. That's what a victim does. That's why that permanent self-pity is important because this is what you'll see. They have a habit of pitying themselves, mirroring reflect, you know, they, the mirror reflects the defenseless child that cannot fend for themselves. Is everything all right? Did they hurt you too bad? 
See, this is what people look for, pity. And then number four is a constant comparison. Because a victim compares themselves to others negatively and fails to realize that they have good traits as well. See, when good things happen in their lives, the victim will find what is lacking or missing. A victim will complain about complaining rather than counting their blessings. They'll just complain about complaining and complaining and complaining and never really see the blessing of God in the midst of what they're dealing with. Number five, critical. They're very critical. I've seen this. You ever seen folk like that? They'll find some negative in every single thing because they're a victim. They never build up others. They tear down in order to feel good about themselves. You get a new car. I wouldn't have got that kind of car. Bring to your house. I like your house, but I wouldn't have got that color. Furniture. They'll find something because it's a deeper issue. There's something deeper going on. This idea of victimization. Number six, they believe that they're perfect. Victim you know, it's, it's caught in error. All of a sudden, they become perfect. This arrogance allows a victim to shun trustworthy and, and cooperative relationship. You know, you, you just feel like everybody did me wrong. I was doing all the things right. I don't understand why this happened to me. And they, number seven, they easily cut people out. Because in their world, there's no such thing as repairing or working through a relationship. They're highly emotional and they cut people out. These are people that just like, I'm done. That's a victim, man. You can't live life like that. You're not going to have any friends. People are going to offend you. We talked about that last week. But you have to get to a point in your life where you can't play victim. You got to be, you know, in the space. So we'll talk about this later on in the series about restoration. One of the powerful stories I want to share with you is the story of the life of Hannah. Everybody knows the story. It's so, it's so fascinating, right? You know, you'll find this in 1 Samuel. And to years of doing all that she could to bear a child, Hannah acted on true faith, and she went directly to the Lord. Now, what we have is a situation where her husband, Elkanah, is in the house. Hannah wants a child. He doesn't understand. But Elkanah, the other wife, is in the house. Or Penanah, rather, is in the house. And Penanah is mocking. They're mocking Hannah. And Hannah's falling into this depression almost, but she realizes that if this is going to get done, you know, I can't play victim here. So after she had done all she could do, right, she decided to take her burden to God. Because if you sit back and do nothing, the burden will stay there. She asked the Lord in faith, right? And she went through this situation before God. And, and it teaches us a powerful lesson. That whatever you are faced with, the greatest trials in your life, you have got to do what Hannah did. She vowed a vow to the Lord. She pleaded for a son. And as a result, she promised to sacrifice. No razor will come to his head. Lord, when you do it, I'll give it to you. She realized something. I could sit here and play a victim about how I'm barren, how I'm being mocked, how I'm not eating and sitting around here letting myself go because that's what was going on. She was going down that rabbit hole she wasn't eating. Penaniah was talking about her, mocking her. Elkaniah was insensitive. But she shifted her mindset. She went to the presence of God. She prayed to God fervently to Eli the priest. Thought she was drunk. She says, I'm not a woman that's drunk. I'm a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I'm pouring myself out to God, to God, not to man, but to God. She does that, and God makes her a promise. After she says, Lord, if you give me a son, I'll give him back to you. And you know what happens? Right after that, God said to her, I'm going I'm to do it for you. And before she even got home, it was already done. Going home was just a formality. Man, this is important. You, the part of you shifting is getting yourself in position, having a made-up mind that I can sit here and wallow in this I can sit there and lament about how bad my situation is, or I can get myself up, I can get up in the presence of God, I can, I can determine within myself that even when people fail me and they're insensitive, God knows, God understands, and God is going to give me the desires of my heart. You know, that's a powerful story of Hannah, but then also when you think about it, as a story of Leah. You know, Leah's story is similar. You have this story, in Genesis, where Leah, you know, this is the story of Leah and Jacob. 
and heartbreakingly sad perspective on who she was. Why? Because here's the narrative. Jacob comes to the house of Laban. His uncle Laban has two daughters, one named Rachel, one named Leah. You know what happens? Well, Jacob sees Rachel. He wants her so bad. He says to Laban, I want to marry your daughter. Laban says, no problem. And guess what occurred? You got to work seven years. He worked seven years in the tent, the night of the wedding. Man, he pulls over the veil and it's not Rachel. It is Leah. Leah, the scripture said, was tender-eyed. She wasn't as attractive as her sister Rachel. Jacob is running out of the tent upset. Now Leah's got to deal with rejection. Jacob works seven more years because he wants Rachel, not Leah. Leah can go through this victimization of being unwanted. Who am I talking to? Who's felt unwanted, unvalued, unloved, unappreciated. And she goes down the rabbit hole like many of us. She starts having babies for a man that doesn't want her. Scripture says she names the first one Reuben. Reuben. <laughs> All right? Names the second one Simeon. Reuben is to see. That means to see. Simeon means to hear. She names the third one Levi, to be joined together. She's sending a message by naming the kids. But when she gets something happens between child three and four, something clicks a shift in the mindset between child three and four that she names the fourth one Judah. Now I will praise God once again. Even if you have gone down that space of victimization and you have done things you're not proud of, thank God you get a space of grace between your third and your fourth like Leah and Leah says, I'm no longer going to live my life to please Jacob, somebody who doesn't want me. I'm not going to be a victim. He may not value who I am, but I know who I am. And so consequently, I will name what comes from me. What births from me will be a praise unto God. Man, I'm giving it all to God. That's when you know your mind has shifted. Like Hannah, who goes to God. Leah goes to God. There's a moment, man. There's a moment in all of our lives. We've got to come to that place. See, it's so convenient to be a victim, but let me help you understand something. When we have a Christ-centered life, there are characteristics of what that looks like because the characteristics of a Christ-centered, victorious life is what I want to help you understand now. To be a victor is only possible when Christ is at the center. You have to choose if you'll be you know, if you're going to really be a Christian or a victorious Christian, you got to choose. And, and, and when you decide to be a Christ-centered, victorious Christian, you come to a place in your life where you determine you cannot get the victory by yourself. <laughs> Only through him. Only through him. And some victories I don't have the capacity to get but it's through him that I get it. Let's find out how. Write this down. Fear does not defeat. In Psalm 112, verse 6 to 8, surely he will never be shaken. The righteous will be in everlasting remembrance. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He will not be afraid until he sees his desire upon his enemies. See, when bad news is not so likely, circumstances pop up. See, the victor lives in confidence and is secure. When we experience situations that seem to threaten where we are, we're not going to be shaken. We're not going to walk in fear. When the world becomes darker, a victor looks for God's light. We shall not be afraid of evil tidings. My heart is fixed on God. When evil approaches, 
The victor declares victory. You think about some of the things you're dealing with now? You got a choice. You can sit back and be afraid. But God is not giving you the spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. A victor knows how to trust God. In this season, I need you to start trusting God, man. Change your narrative. Everybody knows what's happening in the world. We know what's going on, but you got to change your narrative. And here's the other thing. You got to be flint focused. Woo. Gaining laser focus towards your vision and your goals. See, this, this world is in need of leaders who have the word of God etched on their hearts. A victorious Christian is not a talker, but a doer. They're focused in like flint. Where do you get that from? Isaiah 50 and 7. For the Lord God will help me, therefore I will not be disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like a flint. And I know that I will not be ashamed. My God. So that means I'm going to be humble, hardworking, I'm going to showcase the spirit of excellence in whatever I do. But I'm also going to guard my associations. See, because associations matter. The choices you make today will determine your spiritual authority tomorrow. You got to make a conscious effort, people of God, to be led by the spirit of God. In Romans 8, 14, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. James 4, 3 and 4 says, you ask and do not receive because why? You ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity of God? Look at 1 Corinthians for a second. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 3. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Watch this. Listen. Celebrates the word of God. <laughs> this is how I know. <laughs> I celebrate the word of God because I know God's word has value. I depend on God's word. I live in his word. The grass withers the flower fades, but his word lasts forever. People around me have things to say. Or my mind tries to conjure up stuff. I got to say, you know what? What is the mind of Christ? I'm staying with God's word. See, it's so important in this season, people of God, that you understand the power of God's word. That's why I teach like I teach, because I want people to now depend more now on God's word than anything else. When you celebrate God's word, you operate in love. Love is the basis for a Christian living, leaving every little room for offense, right? Very little room for offense. And unforgiving to take place in the root of our hearts because we are so filled with the love of God and we're filled with the word of God. That's what living in victory means. Embracing a promise that God defeats our foes and we welcome a new beginning. And believing in a greater promise and anticipating a new tomorrow. Man, let me tell you something. Victim believes the whole world is against them. But a victim believes the whole world needs them. A victim sees a challenge as an obstacle, but a victor considers an obstacle an opportunity. A victim blames others for their failures, but a victor takes personal responsibility for success and failures. A victim depends on handouts of others to succeed, but a victor makes do with what they already have to succeed. A victim never is satisfied, man, always looking for something more. But you know what? A victor is grateful for what they already have and build upon that for more in life. What are you going to be? Are you going to be a victim or are you going to be a victor? Do you know the Christ we, we serve? <laughs> he was a victor. He never complained about the things that he had gone through. Never spend time lamenting about, oh, the Pharisees don't like me. Oh, this is a rough journey. He saw it as a part of his purpose. This is a mindset. I want you to know who you are. 
I want you to declare over your life. I want you to take a moment now as I close. I want you to really focus in now. And I want you to hear. He that hath an ear, let him hear. How long will you allow yourself to be a victim? Yes, something happened. We own that. We get it. But when will you shift and realize that all the word that's been sown in your life has caused you to have a different mindset? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That you can shift and you can be victorious. It doesn't take much to stay in a place of victimization. It doesn't take much to stay there and just to wallow in. But that's not what God has for your life. He has so much more. And child of God, I want you to walk in there today. I want you to declare I'm a victor. That's how we have the victory through Jesus Christ. Hold your head up. Come on. Hold your head up. Stop walking around battered. Be down. Why is my soul cast down? <laughs> but I will yet hope in the Lord was the help of my countenance. Change the way you look. Change the way you talk. Change the way you walk. Walk like you got the victory. 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on Calvary. He rose and conquered death, hell, and the grave to give you and I both the victory. I'm not going to walk in defeat. I don't care what is happening in my life. I don't care what people did to me, what they said about me. I am a victor, and that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. And I want you to stick to it as well. Lay your head on yourself and declare of your life today. Lord, Shift my mind away from a victim mentality. Shift my mind to walking in complete and total victory. I believe it's done in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't you feel better? I know I do. Woo! I want you, if you need a relationship with Jesus Christ right now, I want you to connect with me by email salvation at mtzionnashville.org if you need a church home maybe you need to reconnect get your life back on track do that right now we would love to hear from you our team would love to connect with you listen I pray this word has blessed you this entire series I want you to share it with somebody be a digital disciple share this right now with somebody you know when you get off of this say I got, you, got to, you got to listen to this word you can't be a victim the rest of your days you got to walk in victory and I want you to stay tuned because next week we're going to go farther in this series. I hope it's blessing you. I'm enjoying sharing it with you. May the grace of God cover you and keep you, and may he bless you, and may he move your mind from being a victim to walking in victory. In Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed. Well, thank you so much for tuning in to the Bible study today, and I pray you will bless. You know, it is our hope this year that we can help you to grow to be a better disciple of Jesus Christ. And to that end, we hope you will continue to stay connected to this ministry as we're gonna bring a relevant word to you every single week. Thank you so much for also supporting this ministry. And if you didn't get an opportunity earlier to give, I pray that you will give by one of the platforms you see right here. I wanna make sure you do just that because your giving allows us to continue to touch the lives of God's people. Thank you, whether you text to give, whether you mail it in, know we appreciate you so very, very much. So thank you again, and I pray God's blessings be upon you and yours. Until next time, God bless.